T.S. Eliot famously said that what makes Tennyson's In Memoriam a powerful poem is the power of its doubt. So it is very much a poem that expresses doubts on several levels. Most immediately, it explores the poet's own doubts about his ability to remember Arthur Hallam, his very close friend, in an appropriate way. Put another way, how, how to mourn a friend that you love so much. Do you try to forget to move on in your life and not be almost daily traumatized by the loss? Or is there a way that you can actively remember your friend that will make him feel close to you, that will do justice to his life, but yet will not overwhelm you with despair? Another doubt throughout the poem is, well, can one find language adequate to express a grief so powerful as his for Arthur Hallam? The poem returns again and again to that question, can one find a measure a song, some way to organize and express the wild grief. But the most prevalent doubt in In Memoriam is less personal and I would say more cosmic. As I've mentioned several times, one of the features of the so-called Victorian age, uh, mainly the, the middle part of that very long literary period running from 1832 to 1901, is the rise of doubt toward traditional Christian ways of understanding the universe. And this doubt being generated by recent discoveries in natural science. Tennyson studied at Cambridge. Uh, he was very interested in science. He read in science most of his life. So he was acutely aware of how some of the recent discoveries um, were very aggressively questioning Again, the basic Christian way of, of viewing the world, in particular, the length of the universe um, and the order or lack thereof of the universe. So if you were um, a Christian in, say, 1850 in England, you could be Anglican, you could be evangelical, high church, low church. You believed that God created the universe as described in the book of Genesis over a period of six days, the seventh day being one for rest. Theologians had, for a while now, up until 1850 or so, uh, imagined that each of those days was worth a thousand years. <laughs> and that led them to theorize that the universe was about 6,000 years old. And probably before too long, the history itself would end uh, because God had a set amount of years for the universe to exist before the apocalypse. Now, in 1833, a British geologist, um, Charles Lyell, published Principles of Geology. And in that book, based on fossil evidence, based on fossils that were actually being discovered in rocks, Herschel concluded, I'm sorry, Lyell concluded that the universe was millions of years old, um, incalculably old and that the biblical depiction of history was woefully inaccurate, inadequate. He's one of many um, thinkers around this time who proposed this idea that the world was almost infinitely old. Uh, Hutton, another geologist, did. Um, John Herschel, an astronomer, suggested the same. So this idea of, of what we can call geological time as opposed to human time or biblical time more specifically. Um, this was a main tension in Tennyson's time. Now, more horrifying perhaps uh, than this idea that the Bible is simply wrong, that God did not create the universe, that the universe has been around for millions of years and who really knows how it came about, um, is the idea that um, there's no such thing as providence, that God's hand does not guide the universe. The universe, in other words, is, is random. Scientific laws may allow us to make predictions about the universe, but ultimately those laws have no concern for human endeavor. In other words, the universe is ultimately indifferent to human concerns, which is so different from the Christian idea that suggests that God, who made us in his image, is in charge and ultimately is looking out for us. 
Here, none of that. No God, no one's in control. Blind scientific law is in control. And that's good, because at least there's some law. But what if these laws are dependent upon you know, random mutations? Now, this is, of course, what Darwin would suggest in his 1859 Origin of Species, that uh, random changes in an environment cause change in species. Now, of course, Tennyson was writing in memoriam throughout the 1840s, publishes in 1850s, so he could not have read Origin of Species. But these ideas were in the air. Uh, Herbert Spencer uh, was thinking about similar ideas, for instance. Um, even someone like Malthus, uh, the, who wrote the essay on population back in, I think, 1798, uh, was suggesting that ultimately what dictates the way the world works is population, um, scarcity, um, and satiation. Uh, the, the, there are only a limited number of resources, in other words, and people fight for those resources, animals fight for those resources, plants fight for those resources, and some will be successful and some will not. So in, in Memoriam, we see Tennyson in several places suggest that the universe is blind to human concern, that the universe may be random. Early in the poem, he says, the stars blindly run. But the most powerful moment, I would say, of the poet expressing doubt occurs in, in section 56 of In Memoriam, uh, which goes like this. Um, so careful of the type, the poem begins the type the type of man was a term used a lot in the scientific thought of the time the idea that that science does not study the individual studies the type or the species so careful of the type the the speaker asks but no from scarped cliff and quarried stone she cries nature cries a thousand types are, are gone uh, I care for nothing all shall go on I bring to life, I bring to death, the spirit does but mean the breath, I know no more. So here the poet personifies nature, who's saying, uh, I really don't care that much um, about your particular species. <laughs> I'm indifferent to your particular species, and what you call spirit is really just your breath. There's no metaphysical spirit running through the universe. There's no such thing as a soul. Spirit simply means breath, and of course, Latin spiritus does mean breath. And then the poet goes on to say, um, you know, for the, for, for the longest time, um, humans have trusted God and, and thought that God was love and thought that love was creation's final law. But nature suggests that, no, the world is red in tooth and claw. In other words, there's no principle of love binding all of us together, but there's this early Darwinian vision of this, this violent, this violent fight for survival. What do you do then? What do you do in the face of this? If your best friend has died and you want to believe in an afterlife, you want to believe that he somehow persists in an afterlife, if the very text, the Bible, on which this idea of the afterlife is based is being proven wrong by science, then can you still believe that? Can you even still believe in love? Uh, Certainly you can't believe that your friend died for a reason. Your friend just died. It just happened. It was random. So the poet is constantly facing this, this doubt, which, which isn't just theoretical. It's very existential. Because if, if the world is indifferent to human concern, if it is random, then where's the afterlife? Uh, where's the reason for my friend's death? Um, does the love that I think I have for him, does it have any substantial existence? Or is it just kind of an illusion? in a world that really doesn't um, foster love at all. So, he wonders at the end. He exclaims, Oh, life is futile then as frail, um, for thy voice to soothe and bless. What hope of answer or redress behind the veil, behind the veil. So, if the world is like this, if it is futile, if it is, if it is, is frail, what voice can come and still provide soothing and blessing? Uh, that's one of the great explorations of the poem. And if you are to find any sense of love and communion, it's not readily apparent. It's behind the veil, behind the veil. So this particular question, it comes not quite in the middle of the poem, close to the middle of the poem, uh, puts before us this, this idea of like, how can you have faith in a world that doesn't justify faith?
in a higher power, let's say. How can you still love in a world where love doesn't seem to exist on any deep level? What can soothe you in a world where there is no metaphysical principle of soothing or blessing? So we move away from a, a metaphysical framework for working through grief, at least at this part in the poem, to a more existential or maybe I should say psychological framework for working through grief. You work through grief by the way you choose to think about your grief, by the way you choose to think about your friend, not simply by invoking a set of religious conventions that have traditionally comforted human beings.